All right, the longest running podcast on the Players Tribune is Knuckleheads, the NBA show co-hosted by Quentin Richardson and Darius Miles, Miles, which just celebrated its 10th year anniversary. 10 years, wow. The uh, show is available on YouTube as well as the usual podcast channels. And Quentin and Darius are with me right now. So let's start here, guys. Knuckleheads, who came up with the name? Uh, did I come up with that, D? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think I, I I think I think I came up with it, but it was based off of uh, the origin of it from um, Trevor Rees and his Westchester High School team out in L.A. Uh, bottoms and them boys, they call it knuckling up. So you know, I took it from that and just called it knuckleheads. But yeah, that's what that's what it came from. So how how does this partnership kind of come about? I mean, obviously you guys played in the NBA for a number of years. How, how close were you back in those days, and how did you decide to kind of? come together and do something like this? Uh, we've been knowing each other, uh, shit, I think since I was like 15 years old, 14, 15 years old. Uh, we played AAU ball together uh, before he went to college, before I even decided to go pro. Um, so we always had a rapport with each other. Um, and then we wound up just getting drafted to the same team. We worked out together uh, leading up to the draft. Uh, when it was time for me to choose a college, I, I, you know, DePaul was one of the schools that I went to visit because he was there. Uh, yeah, we've been knowing each other way before we even played in the league. Mm -hmm. And Quentin, for you, like, was becoming a podcaster something that you started to think about towards the end of your playing days? Never. Never. I mean, I did. I, I mean, I'd be lying. I didn't know what a podcast was. I did go to, uh, you know, the, the NBA gives out programs. I did take the podcast. I mean, the, the sportscaster you thing. I went to Syracuse and did that to try and figure out, like, maybe I go into broadcasting and stuff like that. But never didn't even know it literally didn't know what a podcast was when we when we stumbled into this space. It was all it was all radio back in those days, and really the podcasting yeah. stuff didn't come along till till years later. So whose idea was it to kind of do this and form kind of this union? Man, being honest, we we would have to say uh, Chris Bernard. Chris Bernard that was with the uh, Players Tribune, formerly of the Knicks, and now he's got uh, Rebrand New York going. Um, CB, who's somebody I had a relationship from when I was with, he was there the whole time during my Knicks tenure. He was with the Knicks for like 20, 25 years or whatever. And then when the Players Tribune started, he left and helped start this off. So I did uh, a letter to my younger self and, and like uh, it was in, it was kind of parallel with the show, the, the, uh, the Showtime show, uh, The Shy that was coming out. I did a letter to my younger self about being growing up in Chicago, and it was kind of like the first time I ever told my story. And I was telling D, D had just moved down here to Orlando, and I was telling him, like, yo, bro, like, whenever you're ready to, you know, talk and share your story, like, I got the perfect place for you. It's going, you know, they're going to handle it right. It's going to be the way you want it. And then so when he came in to do his story, I kind of, like, was there to, like, kind of – they called me executive producer, but I was just there hanging, you know what I'm saying, making sure he was cool or whatever. But, like, and they got to see our our real chemistry from that. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, we've been knowing each other for as long as we've been knowing each other. Like, everything you see is real. It's not it's not thrown together. It just, like, happened that way. You know what I'm saying? The story is crazy. So then, like, CB was like, yo, yo, y'all need to do something. And then, you know, uh, conversations went and persuasion had to happen because D wanted no parts of microphones and cameras. So once we got past all of that, you know, that's when we fell and came into this. Darius, had you had enough uh, microphones and cameras from your playing days? Was that was that it? Yeah, I just really wasn't fond of microphones and cameras too much. <laughs> and what, what convinced you? What kind of turned the uh, turned the corner for you? Uh, I just knew need, knew I just needed to do something um, different or something that made me uncomfortable to you know just move forward. Mm -hmm. hey, Quentin, I figured that you would have been the one less comfortable with mics and cameras because you were. Yeah, I covered you a little bit in New York when you were there, in one of the more bizarre Knicks years of of mm -hmm. recent memory of like those four or five year runs where it's like. Larry's the coach, that Isaiah's the coach, that Donnie comes in and Mike's the coach. Like I that that sort of uh, craziness didn't turn you off to the media experience. I mean, I, I be, to be honest, it did. I mean, the media, I mean, even if you look back then though, know, because I, I can remember it vividly. Media door, the, the uh PR opened the door for media, everybody filed out to the to the to the training room. 
I never did that because I, I knew I had to talk to him anyway. So New York, I would say New York probably more so prepared me to do this because it it made me when I when I did this, it made me want to do it a different way. Because I didn't like the way that they did it. You know what I'm saying? I didn't like the aggression. I didn't like the way they tried to divide and conquer. It could be, you know, like you said, we were we weren't a good team. We could finally get a win. And you could see somebody over here in the corner trying to ask somebody who didn't play or start something up, and then it'd be something in the paper tomorrow. So it was like I I never jammed with that the way that they like they sought out negativity and they sought out to like to like kind of try and tear us apart. So for me, it was like, okay, like now that I'm in this space, I'm going to do this the way that I want to do it. And I'm going to do this the way that, you know, I wish I would have got done. And I'm going to celebrate my peers and the players and I'm going to treat them with respect. And, and it's enough people out there doing it, reporting every negative thing or every bad thing that happened with us. So we're going to take our platform and shine the lights on the good things that we do. Cause it's a lot of us to do a lot of good things, even though we have flaws and we make mistakes, it's still a lot of good things to shine lights on, but people don't always choose to do that. And those were, peak like back page years yeah. right like, yeah factual <laughs> like big time like non-stop daily daily <laughs> that was like daily peak mark berman new york post years right there uh Darius, what do you what do you want to get out of of these conversations that you guys have with with your peers there and i think they're terrific i mean i've watched a ton of them you know from damian lillard he's my guy we're both kindred boxing spirits, the two of us on on that. And, uh, you know, obviously Kobe was on the program early on. Like, what do you want to get out of these conversations? Uh, our main thing is just to get a, a, a positive conversation, something that uh, some of these guys got kids that didn't get the chance to see them play. Uh, Sometimes when you go through their stuff, you know, a lot of stuff be like, man, their family didn't know that or didn't hear them stories before ever been said uh the biggest thing is just a a good positive conversation about basketball um for the basketball community i think everybody appreciate it all our guests are not the biggest superstars so you know we got guys that some of your superstar players respect and have have a lot of admiration for for being good so just all around the board we want the the big time names but we just want the other guys that people just might have forgot about or didn't know that they was that good mm. and, and quentin i mentioned kobe and that was probably the biggest moment i would say for you guys early on when when he came on the show like what how, what did that mean to to you to have a guy like him kind of want to come down chop it up with you guys I mean, like V said before, man, I think the biggest thing about that is that we didn't know Kobe. We didn't have a personal relationship or nothing. We didn't know him past when we on the court. We talked to him, we played against him, and, and that was probably about it. You know what I'm saying? So for him to reach out and acknowledge, like, man, I like what y'all are doing. I want to be part of this. And part of that is, too, is that he was part of the the part of uh, people that helped Derek G to start the Players' Tribune. So that might be why he was aware of it or whatever. But for him to actually reach out to us and say, hey, I like what y'all doing. I want to come on the show. I want to be a part of it. Like that was like mind blowing for us. And then, you know, like that's Kobe. And like I said, we didn't have that personal relationship and he was the dude. So for, for us to get a chance to sit down and, and have him talk to us and, um, you know, just chop it up with him and, 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 and pick his brain and hear how he felt about us. Let him know how we felt about him. That was, that was, you know, like you say, that's the, that's the, he was the guy during our era. So everybody, whether you want to admit it or not, you 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 respect that and you look up to that in a certain way. And so for him to reach out to us and extend that, it was, it was super dope. And I love the 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 device you guys use early in the show of uh, who bust your ass, right? Like I, I that that's great right off the bat, where it's effectively a new spin on what's your welcome to kind of the NBA uh, moment there. Like where did that come about? Like whose idea was to kind of bring that to the table? Uh, that was my idea. <laughs> 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 no, it just came in a sense of, you know, uh, just basketball. The basketball lingo, the way you're talking basketball. Like, if you play basketball, you play sports, you remember the first person that busted your, your ass. So we uh, we went with it. Uh, it wound up being the, the, the one of the best answers for the show. And I feel like it's uh, – it kind of levels the playing field when that be the first question because it makes them, before they start talking about themselves, it makes them think about, you know, who's the guy that really gave them work when they was playing. 
No, I, I think it's fantastic. And it's as like a magazine writer, like you, I, I admire it because you want some way to put guys at ease right off the bat. I think that does that. You get a chance to laugh about it, look back on kind of fun moments. Let me ask you guys though, because I've I've watched a bunch of them. But what was your bust your ass moment? Uh, give me give me the one for both of you guys. Mine was uh, Chris Webber, um, <laughs> Sacramento King. Chris Webber. He had like thirty six. Maybe 36, 38, all jump hooks. Um, I couldn't do nothing with him. He was <laughs> I was already a buck eighty five soaking wet and <laughs> when I first came out. And he was so big and strong that man, he was he was just out there killing me. I ain't really got killed like that before. Like the guy ain't really just kinda gave me work like that. I'm fresh out of high school. I was kinda killing everybody, but running into that that was real. And Chris Webber was like one of my favorite players, so it, it, it made it even worse. Well, you yeah, for me, for me, it was Vashawn Leonard. Got in in preseason rookie year. Uh, first time playing in Denver in the altitude. Didn't respect Vashawn Leonard. And had he had about 17 in the first six minutes. We got to that first six-minute timeout. I was gassed out of breath, looking around. D-Miles and Keon was laughing at me. <laughs> But for Sean Leonard, definitely. <laughs> uh, can I give you mine while you guys are on the show? Yeah. Um, so it will come as a shock. I didn't play in the NBA. I know that's very surprising. <laughs> but I did spend eight years as a ball boy in Boston, right? Like I worked the the floors and I worked the visiting locker room for the last four yeah. years. And I was one of those guys that like to kind of challenge guys on the court, like before the game, where they're going through their warmups. You guys all experienced those those kids. Yeah. Back in the day. Uh, one of my first years working in Boston was one of Michael's last years with the Bulls. And I, I mean, I was 6'1", 150 pounds at that point. And I, like every kind of, you know, six foot white guy, I wanted to be Bobby Hurley. So I was walking around with my Duke shirt on <laughs> so, so, <laughs> from that era. So I had my Duke shirt on and Michael walks by and he says, Duke sucks. And I said, you know what? You suck. So, so he kind of, he waves me over to play one-on-one -on -one with them. And I, just, I have a bunch of pictures of it because somebody at the time was, was shooting uh, on the, uh, the floor. And he proceeded to just rain turnaround jump shots on me uh, for the next five or 10 minutes, which was like the coolest moment I've, I had ever experienced up until that point and still the coolest moment ever uh, in my life there. So did my, you still had Duke shirt on? Or did you I still had... Oh, I still had it on. He still when he walked off the court, he kind of grabbed it and tugged at it. And I think he was like trying to rip it for a second. But uh, <laughs> you know, I always wanted to be Bobby Hurley back then. That was like early '90s or mid '90s. Yeah, we all Bobby you know, Hurley was the man back then. <laughs> he was the truth back in those days. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think it's a great device that you guys use uh, for that show. It's a lot of fun uh, to watch. So, what is Underdog? Underdog is the place to play if you're a sports fan looking to win money while watching sports. With over 5 million happy players and $2 billion won, Underdog makes it fun and easy to cash in on all your favorite athlete performances. Compete against players just by selecting higher or lower on two or more player stats, and you could win up to 1,000 times your money. It's 1,000 times. So turn every slam dunk into a win with Underdog. Think Kevin Durant will rack up higher than 30 points this week? James Harden will get lower than 10 assists? Cook up some entries for shots to win real cash prizes all basketball season long. They've got all your favorite leagues, teams, and stars to choose from. Create entries with all basketball picks or mix and match across your other favorite sports. Underdog is the place to play Pick'em, so sign up and deposit now and use promo code OPENFLOOR to get up to $1,000 in bonus cash instantly. That's right, $1,000 in bonus cash instantly. This week, I am going to be looking at all things Victor Wembanyama, who I think is going to have an MVP caliber season. He's got Chris Paul as his point guard. He's probably going to be Defensive Player of the Year, both ends of the floor. I'm going to be looking at Victor Wembanyama's numbers. So download the app today and use code OPENFLOOR to get up to $1,000 in bonus cash instantly. Must be 18 or over, 19 plus in Alabama or Nebraska, 19 plus in Colorado for some games. 
21 plus in Massachusetts and Arizona, and present in a state where underdog fantasy operates. Terms apply. Void in Colorado. Concerned with your play? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.ncpgambling.org in Arizona. 1-800-NEXT-STEP, 1-800-639-8783, or text Next Step to 53342. In New York, call the 24-7 Hope Line at 877-8-HOPE-NY, or text hope ny 467 369 A couple of basketball topics I want to hit you guys on while I have you here. Uh, can we talk for a minute about the statue? Because that's the big story in the NBA, the Dwayne Wade statue that yeah. was revealed this past week. Uh, your thoughts on the likeness of the Dwayne Wade statue? I, I like the statue. I thought the statue was uh, dope. I, uh, that's one of... Uh, I think it symbolized one of the iconic moments in D Wade's career. Um, it's showing uh, that was one of the big moments where he said that you know Miami is his house. I uh, like they chose that image. Uh, I'm I'm happy for D Wade. D Wade is somebody else that I I've been knowing since high school. Got a chance to play AAU ball with him. Um, just to see his career go from Hall of Fame to having a statue in, in Miami, a street named after him. I think that's like. Like dope, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Q, Q yeah. I, I love, I love the statue from the neck down. Like, I, I it, the, <laughs> the, the moment, like I, the moment is great. I mean, I know exactly what he's doing. Like the pointing down, like my house, like all that is. Yeah. it's phenomenal. But then you look <laughs> up, and I'm, I'm getting some like Lawrence Fishburne, Antoine Walker vibes. Like off Man, the I've seen, statue, I, I, I've seen all of the memes, and you know, it, it's like you say, it's it's a lot of funny stuff going on. But uh, like D said, man, at the end of the day, what what it really what it really stands for and represents, man, to know D Wade, you know, came from from Chicago, Robbins, Illinois. You know what I'm saying? His whole his whole upbringing and everything he had to go through for him to get, you know, what I'm saying, a statue and to be immortalized, basically, like that's forever, bro. Like you know, what I'm saying he got. All type of personal things on there with his mom name, with his, with his dad name, with a street that he grew up on in Chicago. All type of different stuff. I, I watched the whole thing, and it was like for me, like D said, we know we know D Way. We really know him from being a young boy and growing up into becoming this. So for us, I see it with it. It, it's, it's, it makes me extremely proud and happy for him and his family, man, to know that he he's taking it this far like you that's 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 immortalized bro you got a street named that you got a statue that's gonna be there forever in front of the arena and you the first in that franchise history and then you know it's only one first and for you to be that that means something it it, it genuinely really is wade county you know what i'm saying like that that that's a amazing thing that he came from chicago and went somewhere and, and made them embrace him that much that, that he did that much for that city and you heard ud speak on it and said too that's mr miami and what, what mm-hmm. he say goes he stamped it mm-hmm. and those look those likenesses are tough to to pull off i mean i think yeah. ed reed has the only one that i've ever seen looks exactly like him like that's the only yeah, hall of, yeah hall ed reed's hall of fame bus is, is identical <laughs> solid man that is that is whoever did that needs to do all busts everywhere all statues everywhere from here on out um you guys were both uh perimeter players in your day i, I was at the celtics bucks game last night in boston boston got up 47 threes in that game which was actually down from the 51 they were averaging in the first few games of this season. What do you guys think of the where the three point evolution is right now? Where, like, unless something crazy happens, like the, the record for most threes attempted in a season is, I think it was the D'Antoni Rockets average about 45 towards the end of the, the teens. South is going to blow by that. The Warriors might blow by that this year. Like, what do you guys think of the, the state of the three point shot in today's game? Uh, I, I'm not a crazy big fan of it because. I feel like everybody is trying to be uh, Steph Curry or or everybody is trying to be Klay Thompson. Um, I I think it it takes away from from the some of the physicality of it. Uh, I like guys going to the hole, getting their dunks, and and uh, seeing other moves outside of just a bunch of jump shots. Um, but that's just. But it is. I'm still a fan of the game. I love the game. Love watching the game. But I, I like the more the inside out more than the outside in. I laughed 
Chris. I, I I just think back to to that 0405 season and how ridiculed my Phoenix Suns team was for, <laughs> for for playing this type of basketball. It was it was like it was brutal. They was dogging us. And we were sprinting through everybody, smacking people around. And yes, indeed, we didn't finish it off and we didn't win it. But like the whole year it was like the rage against the machine. Like they were trying to suppress what we were doing. And now to see that the whole league is doing that and that's all of the analytics and all of the rage and it's all of this, it's laughable to me. Because we were we were heavily, I can like transport my mind to that like sports center, TNT, all of them shows, they was killing us. You can't win like that. You can't sustain that. You can't win in the playoffs like that. You can't play a whole seat. This ain't, this isn't real. Now, everybody does it. I'm talking about top to bottom, across the board. You you are different if you don't shoot 43s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, it, it's true. I mean, look, JJ gets the Laker job. First thing he says, got to shoot more threes. Uh, you know, Chris Finch in Minnesota. We get Dante DiVincenzo. Got to shoot more threes. Like, everyone yeah. is trying to get up. 40 per game but like is 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 it too much to an extent like i, I remember the great antoine walker line from back in the day somebody asked him like they no fours so three say no fours like does yeah. there, does there need Walk to be dog, classic yeah i mean i love antoine i i was he i was in boston when he was here those are my my favorite years uh covering the celtics um it, does it, does the nba need to do anything about it can there be anything done about it, whether it's experimenting with moving the three-point line back. I know Peyton Pritchard was asked recently about the four-point shot. He was kind of open to it. But, like, is this just the, the new NBA and we're kind of have to live with it? Or do you think there's anything structurally the league can do? Uh, this this league is a copycat league. You know, once once the team start winning championships, which is Golden State, start winning championships that way, a lot of teams try to copycat that, but it's hard to put the same personnel together as some of the good teams that can actually shoot. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I think with Boston, I think after they lost that championship, they built a team more to shoot a little bit more with Tatum, with with Jalen Brown. Uh, like I say, it's a copycat league. This is what what they do when you win a championship. That's uh, other guys try to build that, but it's hard to put that personnel together with different players. And I, I think it's a sign of the times, Chris. You know, like, the, the, the game has evolved so much. You got you got all of this training going on in the youth in the youth uh, phases, and, and guys guys are guys aren't training the way they used to. You you don't really have traditional bigs no more. You know, bigs are are able to handle the ball, shoot three, step away, do all these different things. When we were coming up, you were 6'11", 6'10", 7 feet. You was a big man. You was you was you was learning how to drop step and do jump hooks and do things. You don't see these dudes coming in doing drop steps no more. These dudes facing up, can shoot threes, can take the ball off the board, bring it up the court and facilitate and do different things. So it's like I think the game it's everything goes in cycles. When we get some big men, some some real traditional big men back in the game then things will start changing because if you get a big guy down there that's dominant and can't be stopped the coach going to give him the ball. They're not going to tell him to go to the three-point line if he's a big guy that you could just put on the block and he can't be stopped. They're not like you have to – that has to come around, though. You know what I'm saying? And this, I don't know when and how it's going to come around with the way they bringing these kids up to be everything. You know what I'm saying? These kids can – they they come with a full tool set. They could do shoot, dribble, defend, like post up, like shoot middies. Everybody's doing a Euro step. Everybody's got the handles and the sauce. So it's like, it's it's a, it's a different time right now. And I don't know. I think, but I think it can get back to people being on the post. If somebody comes around and he's unstoppable on that block, he unstoppable. Do you, do you th- I mean, do you think that comes back? Because like, I, I go back to the game last night with the Celtics and Bucks, where it, it was a close game till midway in the third quarter. And the Bucks were mostly running a lot of traditional offense. It was like, let's throw to Giannis in the post. Brooke Lopez got a lot of post touches. And they had some, they, they were efficient at times. But the the point differential on the three-point shot in that game was 33 points. The Celtics got 33 points more off threes. Like, I, I don't, I mean, yeah, if, if another Shaq comes along, you, you you definitely, you know, want to build a team around that. But like, if if you're just getting twos and the other team is getting up threes to a 33-point differential, I, I don't know how you win in today's NBA anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 tough, man. And that's like you say, that's the that's the personnel that teams have, and that's the way it's going. And so 
until some of those things change, you're going to continue to see that. You're going to continue to see guys running out on fast break instead of running to the hole, running to the three-point line. We've seen a lot of that, and that's just what it is right now. Yeah, but I feel the guys that stand out the most are the guys that can can make the mid-range shot. Uh, I feel like them are the kind of the better guys in the league who, who can make the mid-range shot and that can post up a little bit. To, to kind of change it up from layups to three pointers. Mm. You know, it, it, but it's funny, Darius. Like, guys like today, though, they kind of get scolded for taking those three point shots. Like, I mean, I remember when Tatum first came in, he made, he took a lot of those kind of elbow extended mid range jump shots. And then, like, over the years, whether it's Brad Stevens or Joe Mazzula, they kept pushing him behind the three point line. Like, he'd go back into the lab with his trainer, Drew Hanlon, they'd work, and like, it would all be behind the three point line. It's almost like, even, they don't want you to be good at those mid-range shots because they see them as such low percentage shots. Yeah, but when the game on the line and it's tie game, <laughs> they got to gotta get you a bucket. <laughs> and um, most of the time, it's not a three; it's one of them middies, or <laughs> you know, right. some some a little yeah. bit more easier. Yeah, you're right about that. Um, Darius, let me ask you one question about LeBron. You were there at the very beginning with him in Cleveland. You watched him the year previous in, in high school playing in Cleveland. I know you were close with him back then. Like, what do you think when you see him at this level in year 22? Like, what what stands out to you? Uh, man, it's, it's amazing. It's, a, it's amazing to see. Uh, yeah, it's just amazing to see him just get to that level and, and do what he he's doing right now today. Uh, I think he had a 30-point triple-double. To be year 22, 30 point triple doubles. He's playing with his his son. He'd have played against a lot of other guys' son. <laughs> like it's just amazing <laughs> to see his career turn out to uh one of the greats in the in the league. Cause he I know he always strived to be that coming through the door. And Q, I know that people were critical uh of the Lakers' decision to draft Bronny, all the nepotism claims, but it strikes me as like having Bronny there is is just almost an investment in LeBron. Like it just seems like it's energized him to an extent. Like having his son there every single day, traveling with him. Like, and when you're at that stage of your career, when you're approaching forty, like any little bit of extra motivation probably helps. I think. I mean, forget about what Bronny can or can't do. It'll be years before we figure that one out. But like having him there, it feels like is is a, a way to get even more out of LeBron. I, I think so, man. I think they, you know, they did it. They they did. They hit a home run showing showing any any other superstars in the future or around the league that's looking or thinking like, look how we take care of our guys. Mm-hmm. Like this is our guy. And you know what I'm saying? We 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 had a chance to do something special and we drafted his son. You know what I'm saying? And it's not like something that's going to cripple their team. It was the 55th pick. And, you know, Bronny has a chance to develop and see what he can become back and forth to the G League and with the team. But I mean, like you said, what it's done for LeBron and the battery is put in his pack, that's that's priceless. You know what I'm saying? That to, for him to be able to have that interaction and for him to be able to have that motivation to go even that much more harder because he got his son with the eyes on him every day. So that to me, it was a it was a win win. And it's uh it's it's something that we see in the league that we probably will never get a chance to see again. That that first opening night home game with with with, with Ken Griffey and his dad there and the whole everything that went into that. You never know if you see something like that again. So you you got to salute that and be happy for them and their family and and, and and congratulate something like that because it's amazing to see the the the, the go for twenty two years and like D said at, at twenty two years still doing it at such a high level and 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 motoring them and, and going the way you are going. You got to salute that. If you don't salute that, you a hater. That that and, was a really cool moment in L. A. Yeah. And the, Go ahead, and the, com- the commercial they got together is hard. I love it. Oh yeah, yeah. When he put the fruity pebbles in the car, yeah, like the <laughs> whole thing. You got to go in on the whole thing. You, it's dope. Yeah, but that that wasn't his car. <laughs> he didn't have to clean that out himself. He was. Yeah. Nah, we know, but it was still just a little. <laughs> it was yeah. it was just cool for the you know. It was funny. It was fun. Do you think LeBron's got another son in high school, Bryce, who's a pretty yeah. good basketball player himself? Do you think that LeBron sticks around? Long enough to potentially see Bryce get drafted. Uh, it's it's looking like it. It's looking like he's gonna play till <laughs> he's forty five for real. He um, if you getting a triple, you getting a, a a thirty point triple double at year twenty two. Like I don't see him. 
I'm 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 not pushing for it, but I'm kind of waiting on the stage where he averaged only 15. He still averaged mm. above 20 points, so it's no why why stop? Like keep going. You know, if you keep on putting 20 points up for a team, yeah, I, I think it's, there's nothing wrong with keep playing. But it's looking like he's gonna play. I think he turned 40 next month. I think it's December. Gonna, yeah, it's look, it looking like he's gonna play till he's about 45 because he ain't missed a beat. Yeah, to me, it ain't even forget about the points. It's the fact, like, look how athletic he still is and fast and explosive and all of that. Like, obviously, I mean, when you get to playing this long, I think he can score 20, 25 points, 30 points whenever he want to kind of. If he, like, really focus on it, I feel like he could just do that. But to me, it's the athleticism, the way he's still – his body is still in incredible shape and he's still dunking like, you know, some people still can't dunk like him. Some young kids ain't getting up like he is and it's fast and all those. So, to me – I, I don't know. I have no damn idea when he could be done. But, like, right now it ain't time. I tell you that the way he looked. So, I, I can't yeah. put a time limit on it. But, like, it's incredible to see. It's incredible. Yeah, and I'm and 40, I give him – yeah. I'm Go 43 ahead. and these knees don't work like that. No, I'm with you. 44 right here, too. They don't <laughs> – the idea of doing that. I, I give him credit, too. Like, the, the new Laker coaching staff comes in, and for a lot of guys it was their first experience – you know, being up close with LeBron. And the things I would hear over and over again from them was like, wow, this guy's, he beats us in in the morning. Like 5 a.m., he's there, you know, he, and he's putting in work in the weight room. Like, so he's, I mean, he's he's as dedicated as they get at this game. It's crazy. It's uh, it's impressive to see. And I don't think we'll ever see anything like it. That's for sure. Uh, guys, yeah. I appreciate you taking some time to talk to me here. Knuckleheads is a terrific podcast. Catch it on all the podcast platforms, YouTube as well. Some great Long form conversations with a lot of names in and around uh, the NBA game. Great to catch up, guys, and uh, congratulations! Ten years—that's terrific. And uh, look forward to many more. No, appreciate you. Appreciate you having us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.